All right, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Take Another Look. Uh, good morning to my friend Kobus from South Africa, uh, to Apostle Daniel Williams, and uh, Tenderheart, who is watching, and others who are watching already. Good morning. We love you. Appreciate all of you so very much. Now, uh, as we get started this morning, let me just say this, that just in case... Uh, someone is watching this video uh, while I'm live or even after it is recorded and embedded into our YouTube uh, or into Facebook. Uh, I want to say that if you've never watched this show before, we are teaching the book of Revelation verse by verse. This is a spiritual journey that I personally have been on for several years, but I've been teaching it online for about three and a half years and uh, even taught it in a Bible study Prior to that, I teach it in our college as a, a, a curriculum, but uh, I just want to say that uh, this is an ongoing series of my own personal spiritual journey, and we're going through the book of Revelation verse by verse, and what I'm sharing is what I believe Holy Spirit has shown me and shared with me, and I'm trying to get that back into the hands of other people, and so today, uh, if you're watching me for the first time, uh, these are the events surrounding the Apostle John, who is um, uh, having this heavenly encounter, um, this encounter of the new of new dimensions. He's experiencing new dimensions of the Father's mind, and we're seeing what we can learn from that. So just keep in mind that I'm teaching this completely from this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, completely from the idea that this book is about the unveiling of the anointed one in you, in me. Good morning, uh, Brother Robert and others who are watching. So very important for us to see that. Now, uh, how I define revelation is the unveiling of the Father's heart. So if we look at that and we go from that perspective, then we're going to continue to see what John sees and hears next. And as he shows us how to operate from the heavenly realm while ministering here in this earthly realm, where you actually belong. Amen. Good to see Dr. Fay joining us this morning. Uh, David Jacobs, our board member, joining us this morning as they uh, uh, watch and work in, in their office today. And so let's get started today. We're at Revelation 20, verse 4. We have the rest of chapter 20, verse 21, chapter 22, and then we will have completed this book. Don't know where we're going to go from here, but so cool. Uh, good to see Heather McCarran. Uh, McKernan joining us today. Uh, so Revelation 20 verse 4, reading from the New King James Version, and it says this, and I saw thrones. Now keep in mind, thrones here is not a throne like we would normally think, but this is thrones, okay? So I saw thrones, and they set on them. I want you to keep that in mind. Someone is setting on, not the throne, but thrones, and judgment was committed to them. So we want to understand judgment. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for it says a thousand years, but really this should be translated the thousand years. So we will explain all of that as we go. Now, keep in mind that they lived is the same they that set on them. And we'll understand that as we go. First of all, in this verse, John was John saw what he saw was thrones, which comes from the Greek word thronos. And it's defined as a stately seat and speaks of position or placement. But then also, for me, this is a metaphor of you as spirit who is eternally seated upon them, okay, keep that in mind, which is a picture of the, the, the spiritual many-membered body of the one, as well as being in complete unity as one in the eternal Christ or the one eternal Christ within us. And they sit on them, which seems to be saying that thrones set on them and judgment was committed to them. So the thrones, the thronos, refers to the position of operation for those who have been awakened and enlightened to the truth of the Father's mind within. So 
this whole entire book, and I know I'll say this a lot, and I have said it a lot, is about not only the unveiling of the anointed one or his revelation, but it has to happen in or to someone. And so the someone is the soul because the spirit, the the, the, the original uh, uh, formula, formula uh, uh, forming of you, uh, spirit does not need any enlightening. Spirit already is fully enlightened to the full knowledge of God. But it is the soul that came into this realm of humanity and had a form of amnesia for the majority of his soul and did not know that he was the creation of God because we were taught we were we were indoctrinated and so on. And so that area of our soul has to be enlightened, has to be uh, come to a place of understanding the awakening of truth to the father's mind. The judgment we're talking about here is a type of course correction. And I've defined that throughout many of these teachings. So I'm not going to go back there. But uh, this course correction is used to help others reach that place of enlightenment of the mind, uh, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. It's not for you and I to go around judging people, but it's a type of course correction. It's used as an aid. You understand that when we read in the Bible, the Bible talks about, Paul talks about the, the ministry of helps as one of the administrations of the church, the ministry of helps. The word helps there is actually defined as the ministry of assistance. And so we assist in this course correction, helping people to come to that place of a supernatural awakening. The fact is, is that you are in this earthly realm to remain, but also uh, not only to, and I'm going to say this, to remain, okay? We belong here, okay? Yes, you are supernatural. Yes, you are already a part of every realm and everything and every place that God is. But as a supernatural being, you belong here in this earthly realm, but also your purpose is to help others achieve this awakening to the knowledge of the glory of the Lord in their earth, singular, as the waters cover the sea, plural, which refers to the united many-membered body of, the, of Christ as one. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, one of my favorite prophecies in Scripture from the Amplified Bible says, but the time is coming when, and this is prophetic of, of Christ, uh, that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, again, the earth being singular and sea actually is written singular, but it is plural, uh, metaphorically. So earth is your earthliness, your individualness, but the sea is the corporate uh, mankind. And so this prophecy was fulfilled in the sacrifice of Jesus as he died and was resurrected to reconnect the memory of mankind to the Father's mind. Now, a lot of this stuff, this revelation we get from the, the original Greek and Hebrew languages, but very important that we get this. And so that is where you come in, okay, which is to help others wake up and embrace the knowledge of their creator. So Revelation 21, verse 3, which I know we're not there yet, but I want to get a, get a taste of this from the Passion Translation says, and I heard a thunderous voice in from the throne saying, look, God's tabernacle is with human beings, or in essence, God's tabernacle is with men. And from now on, he will tabernacle with them as their God. Now, God himself will have his home with them, God with them, Emmanuel, God with them, come on, Emmanuel, right from the beginning of the prophecy of Jesus, uh, the angel said his name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us, God with them will be their God. And so this is just one more piece of scriptural evidence that God lives in his creation and has always lived in us from before the foundation of the universe. And please understand this, folks, that when we talk about that God will uh, make his tabernacle with human beings, look, this is not talking about laying out Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and etc., all the way to Revelation, because the Bible for 
a, a large degree is not in chronological order. There are parts of the book of Revelation that are not in chronological order. We see the gospels in the book of Revelation. We see the, the death of Christ in the book of Revelation. We see all of this symbolism that points to everything that's been written. And there's a lot of references that John makes in the book of Revelation that have that dance all over the Old Testament. So it's not just one thing and it's not the end just because we just read Revelation 21 verse 3. This is talking about that God saying, look, I'm going to reconnect man's mind uh, to my mind and I'm going to be his God. I'm going to tabernacle with human beings. That's what that really is saying there. So now let's notice he goes on to say and from uh, and from now he will be he will tabernacle with them as their God. And this is not a reference to what will be, as I just said, but to what has become a reality through or because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And I made this statement and I posted it on uh, I posted it on um, uh, uh, Facebook uh, a day or two ago, maybe it was yesterday. And what I posted was this, blinded minds simply means still asleep. Blinded minds simply means still asleep. So a blinded mind means someone who has not awakened to truth. Now, as we keep that in mind, let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 in the Passion Translation, which has been a highly misunderstood verse. It says, for their minds have been blinded by the God of this age, leaving them in unbelief. What did the God of this age do? Well, we want to understand who the God of this age is. But first of all, what did he do? He blinded their minds, leaving them in unbelief. Their blindness kept them from seeing the day spring light of the wonderful news, or this also should be translated, the flame of the good news of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the divine image of God. So in our modern Bibles, we are led to believe that some evil entity called Satan Satan, of which uh, the word is regrettably always capitalized, regrettably for me. My wife and I have had a habit for many years that when we write things out, we never capitalize the word Satan or devil, even when we didn't understand what those words mean. But the Aramaic word, uh, the, the Greek word for uh, Satan is actually Satanas. So the Greeks would say something like Satanas, meaning the accuser. So instead of saying Satan in your Bible, I really would transliterate that to say the accuser. Yet in the Aramaic, which the Aramaic replaced the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, uh, is the word Satan. Now it's still spelled like Satan, but it's actually pronounced Satan uh, in the Aramaic language and simply refers to an adversary. So when I have the word Satan pop up in my Bible, I would translate that or transliterate that to say the accuser or an adversary. This is basically how most students of scripture refer to the God of this age. The problem is that the God of this age did not, and I want to preface this, I really emphasize, did not point to any deity of supernatural origin that could dispense evil upon those new believers in the first century. Another point I'd like to make is that when we read the Bible, we relate so much of it, if not all of it, to us personally. But a great deal of it is something we can glean from, but is not necessarily about us. For example, what those in the first century were dealing with is not about us. Who was it about? It was about those in the first century, right? And so as they're dealing with this God of this age type thing, well, this was a direct reference to evil, uh, the evil of that day, which came from those attempting to suppress the message of Christ and that persecution and opposition kept their thoughts um, renewed or blinded to truth. So being blinded uh, to truth, blinded simply means still asleep, right? So kept their minds still asleep. And remember that John saw thrones, thronos, and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. So this reference of J Revelation 20 verse 4 is that we reign in the eternal Christ, all right? But the problem is, is that some do not see that they have always reigned with Christ as one. 
The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 4, the Passion Translation, and he chose us to be his very own, joining us to himself. When did he do that? Well, the scripture goes on to say, even before he laid the foundation of the universe. So before he set the stars in the sky, before the planets were in the atmosphere, before anything was done that is physical or visible by, by the Hubble telescope or by your human <coughs> by your human eyesight, he created you, he chose you, he spoke you into being. That's what the word chose there means uh, in essence is to speak and joined you to himself. And so if you were joined to the creator father from before the foundation of the universe, then that alone would imply that you have always been with God and always been in the eternal Christ, right? Well, the only thing that went wrong is that we entered this earth realm of the senses, the sensory realm, and mankind in human form forgot who he was, uh, uh, that who he was uh, in, in God, okay? I mean, it's so important. Um, now, James 1.25 gives us a principle. Now, now listen, there are scriptures that are literally intended to be clues, like a roadmap that bounces you all over the Bible, but they're clues. Here's a clue in scripture that I found. James 1.25 in the Passion Translation says, but those who set their gaze uh, deeply into the perfect law of liberty, referring to the royal law of love, that's God. So we did that from the beginning of time, are fascinated by and respond to the truth that they hear and are strengthened by it. They experience God's blessings in all they do. But the Bible says uh, previously in James 1, verse 23 and 24, it says, if you listen to the word and don't live out the message you hear, you become like a person who looks into a mirror, the mirror of the word, to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. Or in other words, this should say recognizing your Genesis face. You perceive how God sees you in the, the mirror of the word, but then you go out and forget, or the Aramaic says you drift away from your divine origin. So to recognize or realize your beginning or your Genesis face would also mean to study the face you was born with. Now, when we say born, again, when we talk about born, uh, when the Bible says that the birth of Jesus took place on this wise, that word birth there actually can be translated origin. And so we're talking about not your birth face, but your origin face. The word face comes from the Greek word prosopon, prosopon, uh, which means the front or in essence, the countenance. So the outward appearance or reflection uh, of of inanimate thing, inanimate things, or things not seen by the natural eye. So, for those who believe seeing the man in the mirror is seeing how God sees us from the beginning of time, even before Adam took on a mistaken identity, which resulted in devastation to the minds of those who follow after His example. Now, the man in the mirror is the new man, the new creation man, a.k.a., uh, or always known as the one who has embraced their God identity. I think that's so fascinating, right? Uh, that's so cool. Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, because it is that verse that talks about a new creation, and we want to understand a little deeper about that also in tied into this lesson. Now, it says this, if, and this is the Passion Translation, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, and I love this translation because it really does uh, solidify the intent of the original language. If anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to uh, all that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And it's very important that we understand uh, this, this uh, old order uh, because for the old order to vanish uh, would mean that each person chooses to let go of the old identity that religion has preached to mankind for hundreds of years. 
See, people do not have an Adamic mindset or they do not have a sinful nature. But what they do have is the belief that they have the same mind as Adam by involuntary inheritance. Ephesians 2 verse 22 in the Amplified says, in him and in fellowship with anyone, you uh, also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. In this process of getting the message of Father's mind into those first uh, in the first century, Paul shows us that we they were being built together into one dwelling place of God and of spirit by being united in one mind or of or with the Father. So it's not just that we were uh, it's, it's not that we were. Uh, not always joined as one, but that we were not aware of this truth. See, that's the thing. When you come into truth and you say, well, this is a new revelation. No, it always has been the truth. It's just that we were not aware of that truth. So back to uh, thrones. Uh, we as thrones sit in position to bring judgment upon them, which is, again, is a type of course correction as we help others walk in this truth. I want to go back to Revelation 20, verse 4, but from the Amplified Classic Edition this time. And it says, Then I saw thrones, and sitting on them were those who, uh, to whom authority, uh, authority to act as judges and to pass sentence was entrusted. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been slain but with axes beheaded for their witnessing to Jesus and for the preaching and testifying for the word of God and who had refused to pay homage to the beast or his statue and had not accepted his mark or permitted it to be stamped on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived again and ruled with Christ the Messiah a thousand years. Now, even as the tabernacle of God is with mankind and within mankind, as in the singular form, and yet the corporate form or the united from in spirit uh, form uh, in spirit, we are joined as one as spirit beings. Okay, that's the first part. Now, even though we are joined as one spirit, now in this setting, we can see that John sees the souls of those who had been headed for their witness to Jesus or of Jesus and for the word of God. However, since this book is written in a symbolic language, we cannot view this as literal beheadings. You say, Dr. Bill, don't you believe there's that, that the book of Revelation is a literal book? I believe the book of Revelation, Revelation actually happened in that John had visions of things and he wrote them down. But what I believe is, is that from Revelation 1, verse 1, that it proves and verifies that he signified it or he symbolized it with this message. So he received this message that spoke symb symbolisms to him, and then he wrote it in a language that the first century uh, Jews, the first century church could understand it. So I think that an allegorical interpretation of this would be that when we awaken to truth, the blindness comes off of our eyes, or the eyes of our mind, and it is as if we take on a new mind or literally we're beheaded, okay? We lost our old mind. We put off that old, uh, that old nature. We took off that old uh, order. Uh, so the word beheaded comes from the Greek word pelakedzo, uh, pelakedzo, uh, which means to chop off the head. And that's kind of astounding. But this word comes from not just the next word you'll find, but all the way to its root word, plazo, meaning to mold or in essence to shape or to fabricate or to form. So when you think about that, that we're talking about beheading, yet we look at the root word in the Greek and we find now we're talking about to mold or to shape into something. Paul said these words in uh, Galatians 4 verse 19. He said, I labor in birth pains until Christ is formed in you. The Mirror Bible says, I gave birth to you once through my gospel. Now I feel 
uh, those same labor pains all over again. I travail for the full revelation of Christ to be formed, or this is the Greek word metamorpho, meaning to mold within you. So what we read from the Amplified Classic Edition of the word beheaded and hear from the Mirror Bible in the word formed, we basically come up with the exact same meaning. So it's not being beheaded, but it's literally, so, so listen, with this word beheaded, literally meaning to cut off, uh, the, the, uh, the, the God's word translation uses the exact phrase to cut off because of their testimony about Jesus. The phrase cut off is defined as to point or a, a level that uh, is to, to point uh, to a level that is des uh, designated, uh, 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 is a designated limit of something and also means an uh, act of stopping or interrupting the supply or provision of something. Now think about this. This seems to be symbolic of one ceasing to operate from one mindset and start to operate from another mindset. Or in other words, to stop the supply of one stream, you, uh, you are then free to feed on a new supply or a new stream, right? Well, writer and commentator Jay Preston Evie says this. He says, let's be honest. If there was an elixir that was developed get developed guaranteed to give immortality to our physical bodies we would all buy it and drink it kings and emperors who have conquered the world would gladly have exchanged their power glory and wealth uh, of their kingdoms for immortality but all wealth of all nations that lay prostrate before uh their uh victorious armaments even combined with all the riches the riches amassed in their vast treasure houses could not buy them so much as one single second's time extension of time now in john's vision he saw that they had not worshiped the beast or its statue meaning image uh, and were not uh, branded on their foreheads uh, foreheads or hands now let's keep in mind. Uh, let's keep in mind that when we talk about um, when we talk about being branded on the forehead or the mind, we've studied this in past lessons where we talked first talked about the mark of the beast, the beast being Roman emperors and the mark being taking on their philosophies or their theologies. Uh, there there are passages in scripture that remain locked. To, uh, up to uh, locked up to mankind and cannot be understood with the natural mind. As you all know, Second First Corinthians two verse fourteen says, "But the natural mind, man does not receive, or we could say the natural mind does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned." So, in other words, you can't really approach Scripture with a natural mind or just a, a, a English dictionary and a natural way of thinking. There's some spiritual or supernatural revelation. So, when John says, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, this was not literal, but a picture of those who had a change of mind. And then the Scripture says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So, again, from our last lesson, the term a thousand years is only used in connection with the kingdom of God in the 20th chapter and seems that it is not found in any other prophetic word about the kingdom of God anywhere else in the Bible. Now, as I said last time, I showed you that there were at least six times the phrase a thousand years referred to the reigning of, of souls, uh, uh, to the reigning of those souls who were made alive in Christ. Uh, three of those referred to one thing, but three refers to our reign. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, here's what the Apostle Paul says in the Passion Translation. Even as all who are in Adam die, or of that Adamic mindset, they lose footing, they lose ground, they lose um, uh, uh, they, 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 they lose ground, in other words. Uh, so also all who are in Christ will be made alive. Now, I like the message Bible here because he says everyone dies in Adam. Everyone comes alive in Christ. Now, this is not talking about what you do to accept Christ, to embrace Christ, even though that is an important aspect. This is talking about what Christ did. Now, 
in this, even our physical nature is not of Adam, but only a self-imposed belief system. However, our spiritual nature is eternal and began as spirit before time began. So when Jesus went into the grave, he got up and was resurrected to life in every way, which is a picture of you being raised up to life in every way or being reconnected to him. Matthew 27, 53 in the New King James says, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they, here's the same word they that we've been using this morning, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So not only was Jesus resurrected from the grave, but they, uh, other people, I believe all before Christ, went into the holy city and appeared to many, which is a metaphor of mankind being, uh, uh, res uh, being resurrect back to their own mind, their right mind, with, with the, when the eternal Christ uh, was uh, within arose. Now, here again, since the book of Revelation is about being free from the soul control of unrenewed thinking as we awaken to the unveiled anointed one within, as we saw last time, there is a part of the soul uh, or the mind that is virgin, meaning that it is not touched by anything but God. And so as we look at this here in Revelation 20, verse 4, the latter part of it says, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for the thousand years. Uh, reading this same verse, this same portion of scripture from the Passion Translation, it says they had refused to worship the wild beast or its image and did not have their foreheads or hands marked by the wild beast. They lived and reigned with, uh, with the Christ for 1,000 years. Now, again, the 1,000 years is not relevant here. Uh, it's not relevant of an exact period of time since God is not limited by, nor does he think in terms of time. We talked about that last week, that we are so time conscious but God is not. Uh, when this said they refused to worship the wild beast or his image, that means that, that they had a part of their thinking that refused to follow after the mindset of the emperors of Rome in the first century. Therefore, they had not received the mark or image of, the, of false thinking into their mind by not embracing the ways of mere men to it, uh, uh, mere men into uh, the virgin portion of their thoughts. So those first century believers were rejecting to worship the image or, or connect to the image of the beast of Rome uh, and its religious mindset. Then they lived and reigned, meaning that they embraced the fullness of the eternal Christ within and took on the mindset of life and immortality through the knowledge of Christ. So to be beheaded for their witness of Jesus and established uh, uh, and the established word in their minds means that they died to self and lived as unto Christ. I want to read one more quote from writer and commentator J. Preston Evius. He says, uh, John sees the souls, not bodies. John sees the souls, not bodies. Think about that. He goes on to say, true, the term souls at times in scripture denotes people or persons, that is, the entire being, spirit, soul, and body. An example is found in the passage like Genesis 46, 26, and 27, where they read all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins besides Jacob's son's wives. All the souls were threescore and six, and the sons of Joseph, uh, were, uh, which were born, uh, uh, born him in which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. But in this case, you can substitute the term people for souls uh, all through the passage. Try it and see. Now try the same method with our text. Here, Revelation 20, verse 4, you can, uh, you can do that also. Uh, the phrase souls of men 
uh, only the words of that phrase which you can substitute the word people is them. The souls of the people that were beheaded. You cannot grammatically substitute the word people for souls. John is not seeing people. He is seeing people's souls. And these souls have been made alive, caught up to the throne, and were now capable of judging and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. I want to touch on one other thing. Second Timothy 1 verse 10 in the New King James Version says, but has now been revealed by the appearing or the manifesting or the being made aware of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death uh, or uh, abolished could also be translated unemployed, unemployed death and brought to life at, uh, to li brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. The Passion Translation says, this truth is now being unveiled by the re revelation of the anointed Jesus, the life giver, who has dismantled death, obliterating all its effects on our lives, and has manifested his immortal life in us by the gospel. What the gospel not only means good news, but it's the revelation of Jesus. So we have entered into, uh, entered a new age of unveiled revelation where believers are beginning to rise up and walk in their true identity as the eternal Christ mind within. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 53 through 55. Uh, he says, and maybe just 54, he says, for this uh, corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So as we see that, the important thing here is to understand uh, that when we say death is swallowed up in victory, that means death has been uh, disappeared. It's gone. It's over. It's not available anymore. Uh, I think that's so awesome because the reality is, is that we're so conscious about death that we think about death dying and aging all of the time. But we need to stop thinking about that. Stop focusing on negative things or things that bring a, uh, bring a person closer to the end of life and start thinking on life and immortality. When Jesus came, all things for those who operated as mortal men were changed. The door was open for mankind to take on a new mind, which is a new and fresh revelation of the Father's mind within. Life and immortality were brought to light brought to illumination by Christ and his resurrection from the dead. So the dark door of death, boy, let's, let's think about that just a moment. The dark door of death, the, <laughs> the dark door of death, the dark door of death was broken down. Come on, it was broken down. And one capital O-N-E stepped back into this world of separation from out of the realm of light. It came to, to light by, the, uh, by Christ. It came to light. Life and immortality was brought to light. And so uh, Jesus stepped out of the light realm to bring light into the natural man. Uh, Revelation 20 verse 4 in the God's Word translation says they lived and ruled with Christ for a thousand years. Now, in most places, uh, it will say as a thousand years, which is just symbolic of the 7,000th year indicating the ongoing reign of the Lord. I have no doubt that in the first century, they understood some terminology that we did not get. And in other words, when you step into a 7,000th year, it's not just a thousand years. But in this case, the 7,000th seven, 7, year is an unending uh, period. It is the reign of the Lord. It is the reign of you and I in the revelation of the Lord. And I believe that uh, uh, according to the best Hebrew calendars that I have stu uh, uh, studied and what little I've understood about them, 
is that we have now stepped out of the sec second of uh, the 6,000th year, which was the reign of men, in, in my view, and stepped into the 7,000th year. And that's been going on for about the 12 to 15 years now, uh, if you could put a time on it. We don't want to keep time as our focus, but we have stepped into the 7,000th year, folks. And so the, the bottom line is, is that you are the throne of the Lord, joined as one, and you sit in the place of unveiled revelation, unlimited revelation for the purpose of helping to assist others in a course correction of this present mindset within corporate mankind. And the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness of Jesus denied self-will and surrendered all to the same mind that is in the eternal Christ within. Now, when we say Christ in you, the hope of glory, when we say as he is, so are you, we're talking about that same mind is in you because you are entwined, intertwined, entangled with that one man, Jesus Christ. You're a part of the same mind. And so as we consider that today, the reality is, is that you are a new covenant remnant or a, a remnant of people with an eternal mindset because I believe we talk about the old covenant and the new covenant, but really there's an eternal covenant that began before the new covenant, that began before Adam even. And as a part of that covenant uh, of the eternal Christ, you will continue to emerge, to arise and be unveiled to this generation around you, bringing healing in order to the chaos in, in God's creation. So you know what? We're going to have to be willing to change. We're going to have to be willing to throw away that old order, that old thinking, that old mindset, and embrace a new mind, the mind of the eternal Christ. And so to do that, uh, what happens is, is that we are able to not fall apart when this new revelation comes. I know about the falling apart. I know how new revelation can shake you up and, and uh, affect you. But the reality is, is that it's important for us to embrace truth. So again, I ask you this question that I've been asking. This is lesson number 165. And so I'm asking this question for the 165th time. Are you ready for what's next? Because what I believe is next is just the continuation of change, the continuation of the transforming of old mindsets into a, the fresh and unveiled mindset of the fullness of the Godhead in you. Amen. God has a new level of thinking for his people, for his creation, which is to start thinking like kings who operate out of the heavenly realm of spirit. Look, stick with me on this journey. Let's continue to see more of the unveiling of the, of the eternal Christ in you, who is the hope of glory to the world all around you. Amen. So that we can all discover what John found out as he stepped into this heavenly realm of God and it changed him forever. Even when he got out of prison 18 years later, he went back to, it's believed he went back to Ephesus and he spent the rest of his days there. And it was no longer about John. It was no longer about his accomplishments. It was all about the eternal Christ. Come on, somebody. Look, it's time to embrace heaven's mindset right now in this life so that we can experience heaven on earth. Amen. I hope you got something out of this lesson. Please, please click like and share so that someone else will um, uh, be able to get this message. Tomorrow night, join me for Kingdom Dynamics, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, Pastor Sheila Watts will be my guest on the show, one of our professors from WBSU. Also, Friday morning, we continue our series with uh, 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 Chaplain Shane Gabbert at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, life is so good. Uh, have a great day. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.